This lecture is about the events which took place in Cambodia between two key dates, from 1853 to 1993. These two dates are not only my personal choice, but as we will see, they are essential to the understanding of modern and contemporary Cambodian history. On November 9, 1953, Cambodia got its independence from France, thus ending 90 years as a French protectorate, 1863-1953. These 90 years had a deep effect on Cambodia as we know it today, and it wouldn't be irrelevant to talk about them, but doing so would exceed the primary aim of this lecture. We will then sum up these 90 years with a question. How did Cambodia get its independence from France? This French map describes the military situation in 1945, in what was then the southern part of French Indochina. From a low point of view, French Indochina consisted in a colony, Cochin China. Officially, Cochin China had been a colony since 1862, in fact, in a less official way, since 1959. Cochin China was to be the only French colony in the Far East. Cambodia, Annam, Laos were protectorates, and Tonkin was neither a colony nor a protectorate, but was placed under direct French administration. The red parts on the map represent areas under the control of the Viet Minh, Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian communists, and the Khmer Essara who were considered as Cambodian nationalists. All the ingredients of an insurrectional situation were present, but France was in no rush to negotiate. A conventional army had to face a guerrilla warfare. There are not many examples when a conventional army could successfully face a guerrilla warfare. As Henry Kissinger summed it up, the guerrilla wins if he doesn't lose, the conventional army loses if it does not win. The British army in Malaysia is often quoted as the sole example of a conventional army which could overcome a guerrilla force. This happened in the years following World War II. As a matter of fact, the British group could fight successfully the Malaysian Communist Party army. The example is biased for two reasons. The British have benefited from a 10 to 1 balance of power on the ground, and the most active members of the Malaysian Communist Party were ethnic Chinese, without any support in the Malay villages, the Kampong. In spite of that, the British needed 10 years. What could the French do? Negotiate? Easier said than done. To negotiate, one needs persons who are able to do so. General Leclerc was one of them. As soon as he arrived in Hanoi on March 18, 1945, he understood that the only solution was political. Unfortunately, Leclerc had to do with the warmongers, like Admiral Thierry d'Argentlieu, who had been called a great 12th century intellectual. In Cambodia, there was no solution which would ignore Norodom Sihanouk. Born in 1922, he passed away on October 15, 2012. Sihanouk had ascended the throne in 1941. He was then 19 years old. The Cambodian monarchy is not hereditary, as the king is not necessarily the son of the preceding king. In Cambodia, the monarchy is elective, and the council of the throne has the task to choose one prince among a number of male candidates. One essential precision. The candidate have to be the descendants of King Anduong, who reigned from 1841 to 1844, and after an interruption from 1845 to 1860. We have to know two more things. The Royal Council of the Throne is but a mere puppet in the hands of the real political power. And in 1941, when Narodom Sihanouk was elected, the reality of the political power was in the hands of the French Protectorate administration. 
So, the question, why did the council on throne elect Sihanouk, could be replaced by a much more relevant question. Why did the French want Sihanouk, him and no one else? According to Mrs. de Coup, Notre Dame Sihanouk was chosen because he was a very cute boy. Mrs. de Coup was Admiral Jean de Coup's wife. Jean de Coup was the French general governor of Indochina in 1941. According to the French protectorate representatives, Notre Dame Sihanouk was also the perfect candidate, but certainly not because he was cute. Sihanouk loved beautiful cars, horses. He was an excellent rider, as can be seen on this photograph, taken in Saumur Cavalry Academy. Nordam Sihanouk loved shooting movies, writing songs and poetry. In fact, the only thing which did not interest him was politics. An excellent actor, which could convince everyone that he was in no way attracted by politics. In short, for the French protectorate, Nordam Sihanouk was the ideal candidate, the idiot that could be easily led. The reality would be very different. Nordam Sihanouk's coronation took place on April 24, 1941, a little less than one year after the French defeat of May-June 1940 by the German army. Here is a Vichy propaganda poster. The Japanese zeros in the sky, the tanks on the ground, the decrepit French officer and the caption. Only mad people would attempt to resist the Japanese. The reality was somewhat different. The French fought the Thai army to maintain the integrity of the Cambodian territory. A very unequal war, as the Thai were much better equipped than the French. The French army losses amounted to 500 dead. Japan, in order to benefit from Thai neutrality, offered their mediation. As a result, the Khmer provinces of Siem Reap, Sisopon and Batambang, given back to Cambodia by the March 1907 treaty, were in great part offered back to Thailand. They are in color on the map. On March 9, 1945, the Japanese coup eliminated the French administration, and on March 18th, Notre Dame Sihanouk proclaimed the independence of Cambodia. The flag with the five stylized towers was the new independent Cambodia flag. Independence would not last long, from March 18, 1945 to October 15, 1945. Meanwhile, France had suddenly changed his mind about the Japanese. And not only would the mad attempt to fight the Japanese. The caption translates, Time to free Indochina from the Japanese Hydra. General Leclerc arrived in Phnom Penh on October 15, 1945, and immediately put Song Ok Tain under arrest. Song Ok Tain was an uncompromising nationalist. He had been taken out of Cambodia in 1942 by the Japanese and brought to Tokyo to avoid him being arrested by the French. Because Song of Tain had been the most prominent organizer of the July 1942 anti-French demonstration. The Japanese brought him back to Cambodia just after the proclamation of independence on March 18, 1945. Nordam Sihanouk a brilliant tactician, had quickly understood that the Japanese imperial domination would not last long, and that it was better for him to avoid siding in a too blatant way with the Japanese, that would be the part devoted to Song Ok Tain, the perfect scapegoat, and that will not be the last time. Once back, under the command, Again, the French reproached Notre Dame Sihanouk to have proclaimed the independence without their consent. Notre Dame Sihanouk just answered, I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. Everything was then back to normal, just like in the good old days. But the status quo ante was not what Notre Dame Sihanouk was heading to, and he urged the French to grant him independence. 
As per French turn a deaf ear to him, Norodom Sihanouk decided to act and launched his famous royal crusade to independence. From then on, Norodom Sihanouk would almost always appear in uniform, his ear with his soldiers, with wooden rifles. Norodom Sihanouk's crusade is a masterpiece of political strategy. He demanded that the French allowed Songok Tain to come back to Cambodia. That was a very risky bet, as Songok Tain enjoyed a considerable popularity at that time. As he arrived in Phnom Penh on the road between Pochentong Airport and central Phnom Penh, thousands of people gathered to acclaim him. Norodom Sihanouk let him glimpse various advantages, but did never offer him any political position. In March 1953, Tan, exasperated, took to the bush. This was exactly what Norodom Sihanouk had been waiting for. For Songok Tan, it was a major political mistake from which he would never recover. Norodom Sihanouk had then a decisive argument to negotiate with the French. Peace with me or war with Songok Tan. The Royal Crusade took place in three stages. Notre-Dame Sihanouk went first to Paris, where he could directly negotiate with the then French president, Vincent Auriol. Unfortunately for Sihanouk, Vincent Auriol was a real genius in the art of never making any decision. After that, he went to Washington, where he tried hard to convince John Foster Dulles. The two men disliked each other from the very minute they met. Foster Dulles told him to stop disturbing the French who were fighting the communist Viet Minh. Just wait after the French win, and we will talk about your independence. For Norodom Sihanouk, Foster Dulles was putting the cart in front of the ox. He finally decided to go to Thailand, where he stayed seven days then back to Cambodia in Batambang province, refusing any contact with the French. As the first Indochina conflict was turning to disaster for the French, the time was ripe to negotiate, and the negotiation could finally lead to independence. A few months after Cambodia had gained its independence from France, the Geneva Conference the Geneva Conference followed the French defeat of Dien Bien Phu on May 7, 1954, the event par excellence that had put an end to the first Indochinese conflict. Vietnam was divided into two parts. In the north, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, communist. In the south, the Republic of Vietnam, pro-American, also known as the regime of Go Dinh Diem. The first Indochinese conflict had lasted from November 1946 to May 1954. For Cambodia, the Geneva Conference was much more complicated. As a matter of fact, Cambodia's independence had been recognized by the Western camp. In order to acknowledge Cambodian independence, the communist world, People's Republic of China, USSR, and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam had demanded great autonomy for the areas controlled by the Viet Minh inside the Cambodian territory. Sihanouk could not accept the North Vietnamese and Soviet demands, as this would have led to a slicing up of Cambodia. After a very difficult negotiation, and thanks to the support of the People's Republic of China, Cambodia won its case. Nordam Sihanouk had everything to be happy about. Father of a nation, father of independence, the man who had obtained independence for his country without bloody fights. He had also been an outstanding negotiator, as the Geneva Conference testifies. But he was not happy, because he was a king, and in a parliamentary monarchy, like in Cambodia, the king reigns but does not govern. Nordom Sihanouk did not intend to reign. He wanted to govern. 
It was not power for the sake of power that he sought. At this level, it would make no sense. But as we shall see, he had a vision for Cambodia, and he intended to implement it. In 1955, he abdicated, and thus became, officially at least, a simple citizen. Moreover, he declared to everyone who would listen, don't call me majesty anymore, just call me sir. In the same year, the Sankumrenium was created, a crucible by which to gather the nation's vital forces. The Sankumrenium is essential to the understanding of not only modern Cambodia, but also contemporary Cambodia, as this time is still seen by many Cambodians as a golden age in Cambodian history. Under the impulse of Norodom Sihanouk, Cambodia became a huge building site. Here, Norodom Sihanouk in short pants takes part in the beginning of the work of Sihanoukville oil refinery. More than a mere photograph, a real symbol. The road from Phnom Penh to the Sihanoukville harbour. When the French signed the protectory contract with Cambodia in 1863, the capital was not Phnom Penh, but Udong, which had been the capital of a kingdom from 1602 to 1865. Udong had a harbour, Kampot, and a road linking Udong to Kampot had been built by King Angduong, 1841-1860, three day by elephant, more than a week by ox cart. Phnom Penh became the capital in 1865. And, as there was already a harbour in Kampot, the French decided to build the first colonial road to link Phnom Penh to Kampot. The road was completed in 1910. Meanwhile, the navigation conditions had changed, and after the road had been completed, it was discovered that there was no possibility to build a freshwater harbour in Kampot. France, therefore, decided to use Saigon as the gateway to and from Cambodia. All exported and imported goods would have to pass through Saigon. This decision would be the cause of great bitterness for many Cambodians. France had just transformed its Cambodian protectorate into the colony of its colony Cochin China. After the independence, Nordam Sihanouk refused to see his Cambodian boats controlled on the Mekong River by the Vietnamese River Police and Customs. With the construction of Sihanoukville Harbour, there was finally an entry and exit door directly into Cambodian territory. The American and the French financed the harbour, the Americans the road, and the French the railroad. Sihanouk intended to transform Phnom Penh into a modern city, and his new vision of power required a new architecture. Thus, Van Molivan's Council of Ministers Building, 1957. It is built on stilts. The stilts are widely used in Cambodia, and contrary to what has often been written, stilts are not used to protect the house from ferocious beasts or rising water but to create a constant airflow under the building. It's not difficult to see the advantages in a tropical climate. Van Bolivan had moreover declared that even if the Cambodians had been using stilts since immemorial times, he had had to relearn how to integrate them into a modern architectural creation. And that had greatly benefited from the influence of Le Corbusier. A classic example of construction on stilts is the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier and Jeanne Ray. Nordam Sihanouk was not a democrat in the classical sense of the word. He was fond of organizing large meetings all over the country. He loved to engage in dialogues with the crowds and reprimand the local elites for their misuse of public funds. Nordam Sihanouk was an extraordinary builder with an insatiable appetite for modernity, as can be seen in the following photographs. The building for the staff of the National Bank, 
a work by Henri Chatel and Vladimir Bodiansky in 1964, the municipal apartments, also known as the White Building, were designed by Lubanhap in 1963. The Olympic Village of Van Molivan in 1963. The Chatomok Conference Hall in 1961. The Basak Theater, designed in 1966 by Van Molivan and unfortunately destroyed by a fire while it was being restored in 1994. The Olympic Stadium in 1964. It would be particularly unfair to talk about the Sihanoukiers without mentioning Sankumri Niyum's educational work. Narodom Sihanouk had literally covered the country with schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. It was during the Sihanouk years that most of the universities were built. The Institute of Technology of Cambodia, ITC, financed by the Soviet Corporation, and inaugurated in 1964. The Teachers' Training College for Physics and Chemistry, inaugurated in 1972, a work by Van Molivan with a famous circular library surrounded by water. The central building of the Royal University of Phnom Penh in 1957 and in its present state. The buildings are remarkable, but what about the reality of education? The numbers are truly impressive. But uh, as Benjamin Disraeli said, there are lies, big lies and statistics. Today, nearly 75% of the Cambodian active population earns its income from rice cultivation. And in the 1960s, despite being nearly 90%, there were not many agricultural schools. Education was seen by the majority of young Cambodians as the safest way to escape the world of the rice field by becoming civil servants. Such a system could not last forever. And Nordom Sihanouk knew this very well. In 1963, in a speech and in a fit of rage, he declared, enough, we have enough civil servants, go back to your rice field. Van Molivan who was Minister of Education in 1969, declared, I would not like to be in charge when the young people we have trained will call us to account. Sihanouk was also a filmmaker. He shot 19 and a half movies. Nordom Sihanouk was heavily criticized and accused of neglecting his government duties to make films. Nordom Sihanouk had in fact the genius to turn everything that came within his reach into a political weapon. Songs, poetry, and of course, movie making. What were the problems Cambodia had to face during Sihanouk's years? Educational and economic problems were not unique to Cambodia because, in fact, all newly independent countries in Southeast Asia and Africa were facing the same problems. Here is a picture which summarizes a fact which was going to weigh very heavily on the modern history of Cambodia, the Second Indochinese Conflict, known also as the American War. The destiny of Sihanouk's Cambodia would be intimately linked to this war. Sihanouk's policy had consisted in integrating Cambodia into a powerful geopolitical vision to maintain the neutrality of his country at all costs. In this, he had succeeded against all odds for 15 years. This photo shows a portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was used by the Democratic Republic of Vietnam to support the Viet Cong, South Vietnam Communists. The Ho Chi Minh Trail crossed a considerable part of Cambodian territory. It had been heavily bombed without much result. And in 1965, despite the bombings, there was a transit of more than 200 tons of material per day. Nordom Sihanouk could not oppose the Ho Chi Minh Trail. To blame Nordom Sihanouk for being a dreamer is meaningless when one considers the US war effort to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail with few tangible results. 
Taken in March 1966 inside the territory of Cambodia, this picture shows people carrying boxes. It is not necessary to be a fortune teller to guess what is inside. There was also another trail, called the Sihanouk Trail. Chinese and Soviet ships arrived in Sihanoukville Harbor with weapons and ammunition. The task of delivering them to the Viet Cong units in the Parrot's Peak area was the Cambodian armies. Ironically, it was one of the most anti-communist generals in the Cambodian army who was in charge of these deliveries with his battalion of paratroopers. As anti-communist as he was, he still had no problems about delivering arms to the Viet Cong troops. At this stage, it is important to consider the relationship between the USA and Cambodia. From the outset, these relations are marked by a mixture of paternalism and using of Cambodia as an instrument. We have already mentioned Sihanouk's visit to Washington in 1953 during his royal crusade when he was told by John Foster Dulles to wait for France to end its war against the Viet Minh before allowing himself to ask for independence. 1955. Cambodia was firmly asked to join CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, the local version of NATO, just like the unconditional American allies, the South Vietnamese Republic and Thailand. 1957. For the US, Cambodian neutrality was seen as an anti-American move. 1958. The crisis reached a peak in spite of its mini invasion by the South Vietnamese army, the Americans who were supporting the Cambodian army financially, however, forbid the Cambodians to retaliate using American military equipment and even including trucks. 1959. French secret services warned Nordam Sihanouk of an assassination attempt. 1963. Under these conditions, it was understandable that Norodom Sihanouk ended up renouncing American economic aid, which threatened the very foundations of his neutrality. The severing of diplomatic relationships between Cambodia and the United States in 1965 appeared almost as a logical consequence. In September 1966, General de Gaulle came to Phnom Penh. Unlike the Fourth Republic, 1946-1958, which had a pro-NATO policy, Charles de Gaulle, since his return to power in 1958, rejected the ideological bloc mentality. In his Phnom Penh speech, de Gaulle brilliantly supported Nordam Sihanouk's policy by evoking the right of peoples to self-determination. The year 1965, a year before de Gaulle's visit, was a pivotal date of the Vietnam War. The Operation Rolling Thunder, an intensification of bombings on northern Vietnam, and, in March 1965, the landing of the Marines in Da Nang. America became more and more involved in the conflict, with the intention of victory. For the goal, and his speech is very clear, the Americans, in spite of all their means, cannot win. De Gaulle was soon to be proven right. During the Tet Offensive of January 1968, images of US Embassy staff taken hostage by the Viet Cong were to be seen all over the world. America suddenly discovered that the war wasn't won, that it was probably not winnable and that there was no escape from a negotiated settlement. In 1967, Jackie Kennedy's trip was seen as a prelude to the reestablishment of diplomatic relationships between Cambodia and the United States. Diplomatic relations were reestablished in 1969. After 1966, Nordam Sihanouk's influence had been declining. For the first time, since the early 1950s, Sihanouk had to face a structured opposition. The Assembly, 
which had been elected in 1966, was openly hostile to Norodom Sihanouk. Normally, candidates were nominated by the Sankumrienium before elections were held. In 1966, for the first time, there were no nominations. However, this did not mean that the elections were authentically democratic. Norodom Sihanouk called the new assembly the most reactionary and corrupt assembly. The new assembly effectively represented the interest of the Cambodian business class. On January 2, 1970, Norodom Sihanouk left on a trip to France, a two-month trip in order to rest at his villa in Grasse. Meanwhile, in Phnom Penh, the adversaries of Norodom Sihanouk became active. On March 11, 1970, at the end of an anti-Vietnamese demonstration, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam Embassy was ransacked. In the morning of March 18, 1970, the army took up positions in the capital. The National Assembly was surrounded, dismissed Sihanouk and gave General Lonol emergency powers. Sihanouk, on his way home, learned the news in Moscow from Alexei Kosygin. Three points should be noted. The member of parliament were ordered to go to the National Assembly and give an instruction to vote against Norodom Sihanouk. What interest did the conspirators, Lonol in the centre and Sirik Matak on his right, represent? On the one hand, a Sino-Khmer business elite, but above all, a military hierarchy that could no longer be satisfied with the money from the weapons delivery to the Viet Cong. They wanted the restoration of the American aid in order to be able to divert it and, once again, get rich with dignity. The coup d'état was exactly in line with what the US wanted, as shown by the events that will follow. But was the US behind the coup d'état? The question is somewhat complex because there was no direct evidence of US involvement in the coup. On the other hand, the American authorities could not ignore what was going on. Two days before the coup d'état, the Mike force had been put on alert on the Saigon airport in case things would go wrong in Phnom Penh. The Mike force was an elite unit of the South Vietnamese army and was composed of ethnic minorities from Vietnam, Banar, Jarai, Mnong, and Khmer from Cochin, China. As its instructors were Americans, the US could not ignore what was going to happen. Moreover, the menu air operation, as we shall discuss, had begun long before the coup d'etat, and its extension to the ground required a change of regime in Phnom Penh. Three fundamental points should be remembered. On the one hand, the coup totally underestimated the immense popularity of Sihanouk. On March 28, 29, 1970, numerous demonstrations in favor of Norodom Sihanouk took place. They were brutally repressed by the army. Representatives of the National Assembly sent to the provinces to explain the people about what had happened were killed by the crowds, including Lon Nil, General Lon Nil's brother. On the other hand, and this will be the most important, Cambodia had entered the camp of US strategic interest. From now on, the regime would owe its very existence only to US military support. That was indeed very far from the geostrategic vision promoted by Norodom Sihanouk, who had sought by all diplomatic means to keep his country away from the second Indo-Chinese conflict. At the end of March 1970, Sihanouk went to China, and on May 5, 1970, he created the Royal Government of the National Union of Kampuchea a real Cambodian state in exile. The remarkable text by Hélène Sixus, The Terrible and Unfinished History of Norodom Sihanouk, King of Cambodia, is certainly not a historical work. But 
Sixus was very much advised by Etienne Manac, the then French ambassador to China, and that explained why the play contains several historical details of major interest. On April 29, 1970, Nixon announced the American South Vietnamese incursion into Cambodia. He declared, This is not an invasion of Cambodia. The areas in which these attacks will be launched are completely occupied and controlled by North Vietnamese forces. Our purpose is not to occupy the areas. Once enemy forces are driven out of the sanctuaries and once their military supplies are destroyed, we will withdraw. In fact, this incursion had already begun a year before with the Operation Menu. The Operation Menu, which started on March 18, 1969, had consisted in the carpet bombing of nearly 110,000 tons of bombs. The operation had been named Menu because it took place in five stages a breakfast, a lunch, a supper, a dinner, and a dessert. On April 30, 1970, more than 100,000 American and South Vietnamese soldiers entered Cambodian territory. The aim was to attack and destroy the headquarters of communist military operations. What followed is well known. They didn't find the headquarters of communist military operations, and the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces found refuge deep inside Cambodian territory. After that, the new regime will hardly shine in terms of its military competence. The Chen La Wan Offensive, August 1970, February 1971, was a mixed success, with considerable losses. And the Chen La Two Offensive, launched on August 20, 1971, following an initial success, ended with such losses that the Republican regime renounced launching any more offensives and concentrated on the defense of the cities. The Khmer Republic was proclaimed on October 9, 1970, and the opportunity was taken to condemn Nordem Sihanouk to death. This is what remains of the oil refinery on March 3, 1971, and the war. Republican soldiers bring back the heads of guerrillas. January 27, 1973, was a major date in the Second Indochinese conflict. After the signing of the Paris Agreements, US bombing on northern Vietnam had to stop. It was a perfect opportunity for the US High Command to turn the entire US Air Force firearm onto Cambodia. Between early February and August 15, 1973, nearly 300,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Cambodia. As a comparison, 100,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Japan during the entire Second World War. Where was Nordam Sihanouk at this time? Normally in Beijing, the head of a Cambodian state in exile. This photo was taken at the end of February, beginning of March 1973, in front of the beautiful pink sandstone temple of Bantiesre. Nordam Sihanouk was here with his wife. Nordam Sihanouk had been taken here from North Vietnam via the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As a matter of fact, the aim of the operation was to show that, in spite of the war and the bombings, Nordam Sihanouk was still at home in Cambodia. Even condemned to death, Nordam Sihanouk could quietly come inside Cambodia and play a tourist. Nordam Sihanouk has been criticized very much for this trip inside Cambodia. In fact, and at that time, just like anyone else, Nordam Sihanouk knew almost nothing about these people he had himself nicknamed Khmer Rouge in the 1960s. Most of the photos 
show him with a number of individuals who had even been several times his ministers, Kyo Sampan, Hu Yun, Hu Nam, and exceptionally with the famous Pol Pot. As he met Pol Pot at that time, Noradam Sihanouk declared, a very nice, pleasant and polite gentleman. Unfortunately, not very high in the hierarchy. Maybe number four or five. Very polite, because Pol Pot had an aunt and an elder sister who had been concubines in the royal palace. As he visited them, when a little boy, he learned the royal language and knew then how to address Noradam Sihanouk. But at that time, and contrary to what Noradam Sihanouk was thinking, Pol Pot was already number one without anyone outside the Khmer Rouge could suspect that. Here is one very rare photos with Pol Pot at that time. From the left, Yang Sari, Hu Yun, Sihanouk, Hu Nam, and Pol Pot. Taken before 1970, this photo shows the top-level Khmer Rouge executives. Pol Pot is now right in the center. These people are taken to the bush in the early 1960s and were based in the peripheral parts of Cambodia, the regions of Ratanakiri and Mondulkiri, in the northeast highlands of the country, without any hope to take power, even in a far remote future. The very same people were to become politically and militarily important overnight. They had very quickly understood the consequences of March 18, 1970 coup d'etat. From that date, their propaganda would be based on the following themes. To bring Noradam Sihanouk back to power. To restore Noradam Sihanouk's regime. Although they hated Noradam Sihanouk, who was for them no more than a feudal little king, the Khmer Rouge had understood perfectly well that in a war-torn country and in a time of deprivations, Noradam Sihanouk's regime appeared to the majority of Cambodian people like paradise on earth. This strategy would quickly pay off, and many Cambodian people joined the resistance uprising precisely because they believed that Noradam Sihanouk was behind it. This map shows the military situation in May 1972. The parts in red color are under the control of the Cambodia National Liberation People's Armed Forces. The white part of the map symbolizes areas still controlled by the Republican forces. One year later, in May 1973, there is not much white color left. At that time, the Republican regime had already understood that the game was lost. Nordam Sihanouk's cousin and most virulent opponent, Sherit Matak, offered him to come back to Cambodia. He was refused by Sihanouk. In fact, as early as 1970, the Khmer Rouge had already many regions under their control. This photograph shows a meeting taking place outside with people dressed in black, the Khmer Rouge uniform. It was taken in July 1970, a few kilometers from the Siem Reap town. The fact they were able to organize such an outdoor meeting without being disturbed tells a lot about the domination they exerted over Cambodian territory. This photograph tells a lot about the state of a Republican army in 1974. January 1975. Phnom Penh was surrounded and could not be reached by roads or waterways anymore. The Khmer Rouge were to enter Phnom Penh on April 17, 1975. A new regime was born, Democratic Kampuchea, three years, eight months and twenty days of nightmare. As they entered Phnom Penh, the Khmer Rouge were welcomed by the population. It meant the end of a war, the end of a civil war, peace at last. Those young men and women dressed in black looked very strange to the town population, but a solution would easily arrive at among Cambodians. In the photograph, 
We can see Khmer Rouge soldiers with their B-40 and AK-47 and a Republican soldier with his M-16. Who were these people? Who were their leaders? This photo was taken near Pochentong Airport, three days after the Khmer Rouge had entered the town. From left to right, brother number one, Pol Pot, brother number two, Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, Son Sen, and so on. Today, we know these people very well. Their family origins, their school and university training, and their life has no more secret for us. In 1975, the best foreign Cambodia specialists were looking at these photographs and trying hard to understand who was who, who was doing what. Not only didn't they know these people's real names, but one didn't even know if there was a communist party of Kampuchea. The only thing we knew for sure was a word, Anka. Anka means organization. And Cambodian people were to discover very soon the projects Anka had for them. The eight following points were found in a copybook on the corpse of a Khmer Rouge political officer killed two years later by the Vietnamese. Evacuate people from all the towns. Abolish all markets. Abolish London regime currency and withhold the revolutionary currency that had been printed. Defrock all Buddhist monks and put them to work growing rice. Execute high-level leaders of the London regime beginning with the top leaders. Establish high-level cooperatives throughout the country with communal eating. Expel the entire Vietnamese minority population. Dispatch troops to the borders, particularly the Vietnamese border. And on April 18, 1975, the unbelievable was to occur. Phnom Penh and all the Cambodian towns were emptied of their inhabitants. Phnom Penh and all the Cambodian towns became ghost towns. The only non-propaganda movie about Phnom Penh during the Khmer Rouge rule was taken by a Yugoslav journalist team. They came to Democratic Kampuchea in 1978 to shoot a documentary movie about the country. As they were taken by car from one part of Phnom Penh to the other, they shot this movie. Central Phnom Penh, no one. Remain in the city, no more than 20,000 people. High-ranking Anka executives, soldiers, workers and technicians. The largest part of the population had been sent to the rice fields. This movie doesn't need any comment. It ends on a red building blown up by the Khmer Rouge, the National Bank of Kampuchea. Although they blew up the National Bank of Kampuchea, they still had a currency, the revolutionary currency. These banknotes were printed two months before the Khmer Rouge had entered Phnom Penh. These banknotes were never used. How to use a banknote in a country where there are no more shops, no more markets, no more buyers, no more sellers? What did Cambodian people do? The largest part of the Cambodian population was sent to the rice fields to plant rice, build dikes and dig canals. They were fed with a barba, a rice porridge, with very little meat, fish and vegetables. And when they were not working, they had to listen to endless political speeches describing the paradise to come. To disobey the Khmer Rouge order often meant death. The Khmer Rouge literally covered the country with dikes and canals. When we have water, we have rice. When we have rice, we have everything, was one of their most popular slogans. But in order to build the dikes and to dig the canals, they didn't use engineers and technicians trained in the previous regime. That was bourgeois knowledge. They used the strength of a people led by the revolutionary organization. And the children. The children were no more their parents' children. Family did not exist anymore. Husbands and wife were separated and could meet only a few hours a week. 
Normal education did not exist anymore, and the children were educated politically. In other words, they were trained to spy on adults. Many adults lost their life because of their children, very often because of their own children. A fake example of Khmer Rouge education. These photographs were not even taken by the Khmer Rouge, but by Mr. Gunnar Bergström, a Swedish Maoist who visited Democratic Kampuchea in 1978. On the basis of what he was then told, he considered that Democratic Kampuchea had achieved real progress. Mr. Bergström came back to Cambodia in 2008 and said that he was sorry for having spread lies. Democratic Kampuchea was led by Anka, the great revolutionary organization. Anka wants you to work better. You must love Anka better than your own family. A godlike organization which appears to act by itself. No individual name was ever mentioned. An example will say a lot. Pol Pot was born in Kompong Tom province, in a village on the bank of the Seine River. Most of his family members survived without suspecting that their son, brother, nephew, cousin and the supreme leader of democratic Kampuchea was the same person. All past traditions were eliminated. Marriage is an example. People could not freely decide to marry with each other. In some places, once a year. In some other places, twice a year, Anka organized big marriage ceremonies. And on the same day, 100 persons were married. At best, they hardly knew each other the day before. And for those who hadn't understood yet that they were living in paradise on earth, there was Tuart's line, S21. It has been called a jail. Normally, a jail is a place where people are kept before their trial, or a place where people are serving their sentence. It was not the case here. The people who passed that door, generally at night, were guilty. They were guilty because they had been arrested. Anka does not arrest innocent people. As they were interrogated in the classrooms, because S21 is a former middle school, they say, of course, that they were innocent. You are not innocent. Are you pretending that Anka arrested an innocent person? You are here because you are guilty. Now, you are going to explain how, when, and with whom you were guilty. Hence, the tenth of thousands of pages of confessions. People confess crimes they would not have the time to commit in several well-filled lives. A 19 years old illiterate peasant girl confessed having been an international spy working in the same time for the French secret services, the CIA and the KGB. Confessions and photographs were archived, and the Khmer Rouge did not have the time to destroy them before the Vietnamese army entered Phnom Penh on January 7, 1979. 17,000 people had passed the door of that so-called jail. In 1979, 12 were found alive. Here is the result of these three years, eight months and 20 days, between 1,700,000 and 2 million Cambodian had lost their life. Pol Pot had made a major mistake. From February 1976, there were negotiations between Democratic Kampuchea and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam about the border between the two countries. These negotiations have never been acknowledged by Kampuchea or Vietnam. This photograph, taken in February 1976 in Phnom Penh, provides evidence. On the left, Le Zuen, General Secretary of the Vietnamese Communist Party, and on the right, Son Sen, the Defense Minister of Democratic Kampuchea. These negotiations were doomed to failure. The Khmer Rouge began sending their commandos inside the Vietnamese territory. They killed, raped, destroyed villages, burned crops. The Vietnamese decision was taken in July 1978. The General Secretary of the Vietnamese Communist Party, Le Zuen, was in Moscow, 
and signed a 25 years treaty of cooperation with Soviet Union. Vietnam was then ready to deal with democratic Kampuchea. December 25, 1978, 120,000 Vietnamese troops crossed the Cambodian border in the northeast part of the country, where the Khmer Rouge were not expecting them. January 7, 1979, they entered Phnom Penh. They discovered an empty city. The Khmer Rouge had not even attempted to defend the capital. They had fled to reach their strongholds in the provinces, and a few days later, the civil war resumed. A few days after the Vietnamese army had entered Phnom Penh, a new regime was born. Communist, pro-Soviet, pro-Vietnamese, the People's Republic of Kampuchea. Cambodia Year Zero was the title of François Poncho's book, and the year zero is 1975. I use it for 1979 because an atomic war could not have destroyed Cambodia in a worse way. Here is the Phnom Penh that the Vietnamese army discovered in January 1979. A totally abandoned city, the central market, empty street with a feeling of unreality. The first group of Vietnamese and Soviet journalists in front of the central market. Only in the end of April, beginning of May 1979, were the people allowed to enter Phnom Penh. On these photographs, there are people coming from the surrounding areas. Phnom Penh was almost entirely peopled with newcomers. Less than 10% of the present Phnom Penh population are former Phnom Penh dwellers. No more land registry office. No more title deeds. The practice was then simple. The first person to settle somewhere was considered as the legal owner. And the Vietnamese army? Without that strong Vietnamese armed presence, the new regime could have never survived. The Khmer Rouge had lost Phnom Penh, but they were still very strong in the provinces, and the civil war had resumed. But because of the presence of the Vietnamese army, Cambodia had to face an unlimited embargo. This embargo was terrible for Cambodia, since it threatened the reconstruction of the country. Let's consider the people trained before 1975. Doctors, engineers, professors, technicians. Less than 30% of them remained alive in 1979 Cambodia. The new regime was slowly being put in place. On the right, in uniform, Pensovan had been the general secretary of the People's Revolutionary Party of Kampuchea from 1979 to 1981, and prime minister from June to December 1981. On the left, Chia Sin and Heng Samrin, who defected to Vietnam in 1978, played also an important part. In 1984, Hun Sen became prime minister. The People's Republic of Kampuchea faced an extremely difficult situation. Everything had to be put back in working order. Education, post and telecom, currency, private property, and all that in a state of war. Khmer Rouge were still here and could maintain the Cambodia UN seat. Western power supported all the guerrilla movements against the Vietnamese, of course, included the Khmer Rouge. The financial aid US provided to the Khmer Rouge has been estimated to more than $84 million between 1980 and 1986. In December 1979, Phan Ban Dong came to Phnom Penh. In a famous speech, he announced the world that as soon as the new regime could defend itself and refrain the Khmer Rouge to take back the power, the Vietnamese army would withdraw. In 1983, about 10,000 Vietnamese soldiers were sent back home. But the event that was going to change everything occurred 
in Soviet Union in 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became the first secretary of the Soviet Union Communist Party. One year later, in 1986, it became obvious to everyone that Soviet Union was no more in a position to support the Vietnamese armed effort in Cambodia. The Vietnamese army was going to withdraw. The withdrawal took place in 1989. With the departure of the last Vietnamese soldiers from Cambodia, everything was ready for the Paris Conference on Cambodia. On October 23, 1991, the Paris Agreements were signed, and that led to the creation of the United Nations Transitional Authority for Cambodia. 25,000 people were sent to Cambodia with the following tasks. To disarm the various groups, to replace the existing administration, and to organize May 1993 general elections. Problems were not long in appearing. Khmer Rouge didn't want to disarm and finally did not take part in the election. The civil war resumed and lasted till 1998. In spite of that, there were a huge turnout for the election. 89.56% of Cambodian people in age of voting went to vote. Following the election in 1993, and according to the new constitution, Narodom Sihanouk ascended the throne for the second time. I evoked at the beginning of his lecture two days, 1953 and 1993. 1953 saw the independence of Cambodia, and this introduction stops in 1993, which is also a key date, as the 1993 events and their consequences are essential to the understanding of modern and contemporary Cambodia.